This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Yakov Katz. He is a columnist for the Jerusalem Post, a senior fellow at the Jewish People Policy Institute, spent a year at Harvard doing a fellowship in journalism, and is the author of Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, which I highly recommend to everyone, not just for the mission itself, but for the broader context that it provides for the region in general. And now, without further ado, Yakov Katz. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know how much you have going on. I know you have family members uh, involved in the response to uh, the October 7th events. And um, and this right here, so we'll, we'll, I'll hold this up since I just uh, we just talked about it uh, as far as being a fan. Uh, although this isn't about exactly about what happened over the last uh, couple weeks here, it provides a, a greater context, I think. So if people were to pick up Shadow Strike, uh, your book about a mission to uh, destroy a Syrian um, nuclear reactor, uh, it'll provide greater context, I think, to what's going on now both military on the military side and uh politically uh as well so uh thank you for writing this and i'm i want to ask you just something about this at the end but are you uh at least we can start off are you uh are you in jerusalem right now i'm in jerusalem yeah yeah and, and uh, how, how did you find out about the uh the attacks on uh on october 7th so honestly saturday morning october 7th i'm lying in bed it's about saturday so you know, we're taking a slow morning. It's about 8.15, 8.20 in the morning, and a, and a siren goes off. And I'm like, holy shit, like, where did this come from? I wake up my wife. I scream at the kids. Let's go. All the kids were home. I got four. We run downstairs to the bomb shelter. I grab my phone, and we run downstairs. As we're going downstairs to the bomb shelter, living in Jerusalem, you have about a minute or so till that rocket potentially lands. Uh, and I'm looking at the phone. I see, wow, there's something going on down in Gaza. Uh, siren ends. We go back upstairs and I start to catch up on what's going on. In the meantime, our daughter, my oldest, she's 20. And she's just finished her first year in the IDF and the Israel Defense Forces. Um, and now she tried out and was accepted to the officer's training school. So she's been spending the last month since August, I would say, at the end of August, uh, training to become an IDF officer, commander. And her ceremony is supposed to be, I think, November 7th. I don't know what it'll be with that now, but um, she, her phone starts to light up. They get, you know, everyone still, it's the early morning. People are just figuring out what's going on. It took, there was a lot of fog around what was happening. Um, but we're catching up. Obviously, we're, we're, we're filling in, you know, I'm talking to people. She's getting orders, stay, we don't need you yet, this, that, the other, later that evening she's called back to base uh my brother who lives near tel aviv uh is called up right in the middle of the day sent straight up to the lebanese border because he did his service in one of those more elite combat units that specializes in the north three of our nephews are called up from home scrambled down to gaza um and i'll tell you you know there's a lot as some as a reporter for many years and as a journalist, I've covered a lot of wars and conflicts here. It's one thing when you go, right? <laughs> that, that's okay. But when you take your daughter to the bus that's gonna be taking her, and she's not again, she's not in the front lines, and she she spent the last two weeks pretty much in one of the towns that was attacked doing security and helping out with, with the town. But still, when you don't know what's going to be, you don't know, and you drop her off at the bus and you see her walk away with the big backpack that, you know, the, the M16 along, that does something to you, Jack. What can I tell you? I, mean, I can only imagine our, our daughter is just a couple of years younger um, in college right now. And of all our kids, she'd be the one that would, uh, I think, be the most likely to, to serve in the military because of uh, uh, a little bit because of me, but also because of these World War II veterans that she's gotten to know through a, the Best Defense Foundation, going back to Pearl Harbor, taking them back to Pearl Harbor, taking them back to, to Normandy. And it's, uh, it's a really incredible program for her to be able to hear these stories from World War II veterans um, who won't be with us for, for much longer. But I think that 
Please. So, so she'd be the. So I'm, I'm just picturing her going off with her backpack and her rifle uh, as your daughter. And, and you know what? I think that you know this also. I served in the IDF and did reserves for many years. Again, if they called you up tomorrow, you would go in a second, right? Yeah. I mean, you you wouldn't be worried about yourself, but when it's your children, it's a whole other level of anxiety, right? Totally. Uh, I often wonder how uh, how it was for my parents when uh, I was going downrange to Iraq and Afghanistan. They know a deployment's coming up, and um, you know I think they handled it fairly stoically. They never really let me know that they were too worried. I can imagine that they were, but uh, oh, I can't imagine our our kids going off like yours has. And it's a little, and it's also a little different, I think, because it's your country, it's home soil. It's not like I went down to a state away or uh, you know 100 miles away. Uh, I went to a, across the world. Um, it might be a, feel a little different. I can, I'm just trying to trying to imagine if your children are going off to defend your home you know. But I'll, I'll tell you though, yeah, I'll tell you the difference, and that is something that there's a saying in Hebrew which we would we call milchama al habayit. It's a war over our home. And that's really what this is now, because they came into our homes on that Saturday morning. They butchered and massacred children and women and men and Holocaust survivors and killed parents in front of their kids and kids in front of their parents, decapitated people. I mean, the most horrific images. And you've been in you've seen what these terrorists can do. You know this stuff, things that we did not imagine would be possible that our enemies really. But this is what they did. It was it was an attempt to annihilate us and therefore for israelis now there is an understanding that we have no choice we have to fight so even though we're all concerned about all our family and my story is not unique you go to any other israeli today they have loved ones who are fighting they know people who have been murdered they know people who have been abducted i mean i know a number of people killed i know a number of people taken hostage that's the story of every Israeli right now. But but we understand that we have to change this reality. It's not something that any country should have to live with. Yeah, and that's a, that was something I was going to ask you about, too. And I have so many questions. I know we're not going to ever get to all of these in our 45 minutes. So we'll, uh, we'll, 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 maybe we can, we can come back and talk a little a little later to get through all these. Um, and I definitely want to be respectful of uh, of your time. Um, but it, it's uh, it's something I thought about fairly early on and uh, I've heard a couple other people use use the term and when I first thought of it I was trying to think of a better term to use uh, than opportunity um, but it it seems like this is a significant paradigm shift that gives Israel for lack of a better term that opportunity to deal with the security situation in Gaza and possibly with Hezbollah and Lebanon to the north um how do you view uh view that perspective this is 100 percent an opportunity right the 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 change that we have now and the enemy that has presented itself shows us what's really going on and what the enemy is like israel has a chance now because also of the global support we have president biden here prime minister sunak from the uk german chancellor schultz from germany and other world leaders who have who have stopped by Blinken here twice, Lloyd Austin here once. Everybody understands that Israel, and I think Sunak said this perfectly. You don't have a you don't have a responsibility to defend yourself. It's 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 an obligation, right? Now he said you don't have a right. You have an obligation, and that's true. So everyone gets it. Now the question is, can Israel change the paradigm? Can it change the equation? We've lived so long with terrorists on our southern border with Gaza and our northern border with Lebanon. We would watch Jack as they would train, as they would amass weapons, as they would install the rockets in the launchers. We knew that what they were doing, but we said, no, they're contained, they're deterred, they don't really want war, but then they came for us. So now the question is, can we change everything and not only prevent them from ever doing it again, but create a new reality that they will never be able to threaten us even again, stop them from ever amassing weapons again, and create better stability for the entire region. That's the the ultimate objective, I think. Yeah, no, it seems like it seems like that. I was just trying to think of another word than opportunity. Um, and, and as a journalist, uh, you've been doing this for for a long time, and uh, obviously covering not just Israel but but world world events. But um, 
how long do you think, or have you been surprised by, or have you noted, I know you've been so, so busy, um, the difference in Western media, not all, I'm just using this term broadly, uh, the difference between how some people reacted to Ukraine and Russia versus how they are reacting to uh, Israel and Hamas, um, meaning some calls from certain quarters for restraint, for ceasefires, um, that, that sort of thing, whereas it was the opposite from those same uh, institutions generally and people uh, more specifically when it came to Ukraine. Are you noticing that or are you too focused on what's going on right now? You'd have to be blind not to notice it, right? Unfortunately, okay. you know, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I spent, I, sp I did a fellowship at Harvard back 10 years ago. It was one of the greatest years of my life as a journalist and uh, was able to soak in all the amazing academic excellence that that place has to offer. And I remember when Ukraine happened, right away there's a Ukrainian flag flying from Harvard Yard and statements come out right away from the Harvard leadership and president. But when it came to Israel, not a word, right? Not a word for a couple of days. And one statement comes out, doesn't really say much. Instead, you have student groups at Harvard, as well as other schools, and I don't mean to pick on Harvard, that are that are coming out and saying, we want restraint, not being clear and unequivocal on whose side they stand in this conflict, right? You saw it the other day when there was that explosion at the hospital in Gaza. And right away, Hamas comes out and says, by, by the way, they don't call themselves Hamas. They say the Palestinian Health Ministry, right? In other words, Hamas, 500 people killed in an Israeli bombing. Israel says, look, we don't know of any attack there. We're going to look into it because we're a responsible democratic country. We can't just say something off the cuff. They look into it. A couple hours later, they say, here's the evidence. It wasn't us. It was an Islamic Jihad rocket that was fired at us that fell short and killed their own people. Still, the world doesn't believe Israel. Still today, I have people who say to me, the rocket whose cause was uncertain, or the blast whose cause was uncertain. So in other words, you're willing to take the word of a ruthless, murderous terrorist organization, and you're questioning what we say as a country? But what does that say about the media, Jack? Right? I mean, it, does the media not understand what the responsibility they have and what they have to do for the, for, for the world? How people then, by the way, I've seen images over the last two days, over the last the, the few days after that blast, burning down of synagogues, attacks on Jews, calls of anti-Semitic anti-Semitism around the world, and and riots in Turkey and in Spain and Tunisia and other places. So where do they get that from? They get it from what they're being told and what they're reading. Yeah, I was going to ask you specifically about that. And I was going to specifically pick on Harvard because I knew you did the, the fellowship there. Um, but uh, the hospital, one, yeah, one, just one example right there. And we have uh, a, sa the same type of an example with, with Ukraine, with them saying that uh, Russia is deliberately targeting hospitals. And OK, there's not but there wasn't any sort of debate over whether that was true or not. But you're seeing it in Israel. And that's and there and there's there's a lot of those other the cycle of violence people talking about uh cycle between Israel and Hamas you didn't hear about a cycle of violence really with Russia and Ukraine and uh justifying uh what Hamas did because this is a border territorial dispute yet you don't see that sort of thing with you like it, there's a stark difference between reporting on Ukraine and reporting on Israel and do you think and elections another one do you think if israel suspended elections and instituted martial law and did all these things that ukraine has done what what would the press comment commentary on that be uh one can only you know suspect. Uh, look you, do you think that reeks of anti-semitism but what is what is that why is there such a difference so you know I, I, my whole life i've hated to say that the answer is it's just anti-semitism because I think what it does is it also, it kind of wipes the slate. It makes it seem as if we don't have a responsibility. And Israel has a responsibility also to get out information quickly and to explain what it's doing and to, and to clarify for the world what's happening. So if we just say everybody's an anti-Semite, then it's as if we don't have to make an effort to do anything. So I, I always stay away from that. However, what we're seeing happening is it's if Jewish blood is cheap and it doesn't mean the same for when, when compared to other people in the world. 
You're hundred percent right that, you know, with Ukraine, the whole world is behind Ukraine, supporting Ukraine, giving weapons to Ukraine. No one is questioning what Ukraine does. But when it comes to Israel, right away, restraint, right away, don't attack, right away, hold back. Don't go into Gaza, open the humanitarian corridor to Gaza, spare civilian casualties in Gaza. I said the other day on an interview on CNN, I said, you know, they were asking me, okay, we understand you have to go in, but what you also have to take care of the civilians. So I said, here's what I don't understand. You're saying to us, take care of this, don't go into Gaza. So we, we shouldn't be able to defend ourselves. Then you're saying, take care of the civilians. Okay, so go into Gaza. So we drop leaflets that say, from go from the north to the south. And then you say, that's not enough. So basically what you're saying is you have no right to defend yourselves, Israel. That's basically what the world is saying to Israel. And that's unacceptable. Service isn't just what Navy Federal Credit Union does. It's who they are. That's why Navy Federal created tools to help you earn and save more. Make your financial goals a reality with great rates and low fees. Members enjoy earnings and savings of $473 per year by banking with Navy Federal, an average credit card APR that's 6% lower than the industry average, a market-leading regular savings rate nearly two times the industry average. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash offers. I've been a member of Navy Federal since I enlisted in the Navy in 1996 and have had nothing but positive experiences with them for what is now closing in on 30 years. Wherever we were stationed, whether at home or abroad, Navy Federal was by our side. Navy Federal has made it their mission to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. With their new no refi rate drop option, you can buy a home now. And if rates drop later, you can then lower your rate without refinancing. Plus, they also offer mortgage options with zero down payment. So you don't need to wait years to save at Navy Federal. Our members are the mission. Find out more at NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, membership required, equal housing lender, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. NavyFederal.org. There are stark contrasts for sure, who for anyone who would like to take a breath and and look at it and really analyze uh, the difference in, in reporting and by the and, and by default, that's uh, essentially manipulation of thoughts and behaviors towards Israel based off that that type of reporting. So it's very it's it's a very interesting case study uh, to be sure. It's a very at the very least, and it's heartbreaking um, on the other side of it as well, knowing what's going to happen with frontline soldiers going into Gaza probably very shortly here. Um, and then there's the time factor. So how long do you think Israel has to deal with? Gaza specifically, and I'd like to talk about Hezbollah in a, in a little bit, but let's Gaza envelope, Gaza specifically. How long does Israel have to go in there and still maintain that support you talked about earlier from President Biden and different different world leaders yeah. before that CNN effect, before those images of, uh, of uh, collateral damage are plastered all over the world and all over social media to shift the perspective of some of those leaders or some of their constituents um, against Israel. And we'll hear more calls for restraint. How long do you think Israel has to deal with this situation? And is that something that that is in their calculus? Um, like how, how, how much of their calculus is based upon a timeline like that? So that that's the, the biggest question right now because there's no doubt that Israel at the end needs the support, particularly of the United States. I would say that, you know, Europe, they'll fall to the side quite quickly. We know that, right? Uh, and that, that, you know, we could blame them, we could get upset, but we also recognize that. When it comes to America, I mean, look, look behind me. I got the Apache and the F-35, right? These are two platforms that Israel flies and flies in combat, both made in America. Israel wants to continue to fly those during the war. It will need munitions. It will need spare parts, right? To get that, to keep up that flow requires really good tight relations with America, to keep the, the, the supply of the JDAMs and the Iron Dome interceptors and any other, you know, GBU, bunker buster, whatever Israel might need. They need to keep that supply line going. So America really has the greatest influence over Israel. 
And it, it's beyond just the diplomatic support that some people think that America provides Israel at the Security Council table. It, it has to do with that. So my, my, my guess is that there's a clock that's ticking once this operation goes underway. I would probably say it's a matter of weeks. It's not going to be months. And it's going to be when the president and his team say to Israel, you guys got to start to wrap this up. Now, Israel can push with that. It can be very careful and try to minimize what you call the CNN effect. But that will come into play at some point. And when that happens, that's probably going to be the indicator. You got to start to find a way to, 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 to bring this to an end. And, and that's why I would I would believe the army is going to go, the ground forces, they're going to go in strong and they're going to go in heavy and they're going to have to be aggressive because the time will not be on their side. And if they want to achieve the mission of degrading Hamas's capabilities, killing and capturing as many of their leaders and fighters and, and, and destroying tunnel networks and weaponry and you name it, they're going to have to move fast. So, so, yeah. so it's going to be complicated in that sense. Yeah. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, di different politicians, military leaders, uh, people who have come back to the government uh, talking about objectives. Um, what do you think the well, Israel's options are on one side and objectives will be when they clearly articulate it for for the world if they if they do? Is it an overthrow of the Hamas government there so that uh, another Palestinian government can can uh, can come up and, and take power in Gaza, uh, degrading that military capability, uh, military capability, terrorism capability coming out of uh, out of Gaza. Um, what do you think? Because we, as we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's very hard to completely destroy uh, an, an insurgency, a terrorist organization uh, it can degrade it, set it back by decades even. Um, but in that process, just by default, you're creating more terrorists as you uh, as you kill some of these guys. It's just how it just how it goes. Um, sure. So it's really hard to completely destroy. Um, what do you think Israel's one options are, and then objectives will be? So, I actually wrote a piece for the weekend, basically on that exact question. Right? What, what is the end mechanism? What is the exit strategy? We all know, and you know this firsthand, right? You know how you go into war but you don't know how you get out, right? And you might have an idea how you're gonna get out, but things are gonna go very, they're gonna change a million times till that becomes possible. Um, I think Israel's ideal objective at the moment is topple Hamas. Now, what does topple Hamas mean? It means degrading completely capabilities, like I said before, killing and capturing, but also bringing them down as a governing entity inside Gaza. So they don't have the ability to govern. Now, the problem here, and America has made this mistake numerous times in places where you saw combat, Afghanistan, Iraq. Okay, we'll come in and on our shoulders, we're gonna carry the new leader, right? And then that person comes and gets killed or gets thrown out or it doesn't work out, right? Because it's never good for foreigners to come in and bring in the new leader. We all know that. So how can you do that in a way that it doesn't seem like this new person is a puppet of Israel or a puppet of America or a puppet of someone else? And that's going to be very complicated. I think what's probably more likely, and I've been talking with some U.S. diplomats about this, is the likelihood of a wider diplomatic resolution to this, which could, you know, the conflict might end with a ceasefire. It might see the Palestinian Authority come in and take over. And maybe a Saudi initiative. We were talking a lot about Saudi Arabia normalizing relations with Israel prior to this conflict. Maybe the Saudis do something. They take some responsibility over this whole thing. But what I'll say also in, in, in more military perspective, if you look at Israel's history as a country of 75 years, we've never initiated conflict with preemptive action. There have only two, been two exceptions. One is nuclear. When we took out Iraq's reactor in 81, Syria's reactor in 2007, the story of my book that you showed before. And the second category is what's been happening in Syria for the last 10 years since the civil war there. Israel has been striking almost weekly at Iranian efforts to entrench themselves and build up a bases in Syria. But the reason they could do it in Syria was because there was no government and no fear of retaliation. But in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria prior to the civil war, when we saw them amassing chemical weapons in the 80s and the 90s, we never took action. 
When we saw Hamas building up its weapons, we didn't take action. Hezbollah, after the 2006 war, went from 20,000 rockets to 150,000. We never took action. Why? We didn't want to be the ones to initiate conflict, to instigate it. We would defend ourselves. I think now, after what we do in Gaza, the day after we have to institute a new policy where preemption is the pillar. So if we see in two months from now, after this war ends, Hamas guys again crawling through the sand, training for an invasion, I don't want to sound terrible, but we have to kill them right, right away. There. We see them bring in a truckload of rockets. We blow that thing up right away. There is no more let's contain, let's deter. No, this is going to be a continuous war that will require Israel to continuously operate in a preemptive way that we haven't done before. Do you think that that model then, uh, if we're talking specifically about Gaza, will then apply to the north, apply to Hezbollah, Lebanon? Uh, we talked about 150,000 rockets pointed at Israel. Uh, is that 200,000 rockets in a month? Is it 300,000 rockets next year? Uh, what does the Gaza situation, and this is all predicated on what Hezbollah does in the north. I saw this morning there were there were more more rocket uh, attacks, um, or there, there have been, but, uh, but it still seems like the old policy is applying to Hezbollah for the moment. Is that going to change? Look, that will change if Hezbollah does something that crosses the threshold of this conflict. For the moment, what Hezbollah has been doing for the last two weeks is daily provoking Israel. There's an anti-tank missile one day. There's a mortar round barrage one day. There's a couple of rockets, like you mentioned today. Every day they're doing something else, but they're keeping it under a certain threshold. They're not firing deep into Israel. They have that capability. They're keeping things very much skirmishes along the border. Let's call it that. So Israel, from its perspective, is saying, look, we got to focus on Gaza. So for now, we'll try to contain still Hezbollah because we it'll be hard for us to fight on two fronts at the same time. Yeah. If Hezbollah escalates, and that might happen, the big test will be when Israel goes into Gaza, what Hezbollah does. If they fire a volley off to the city of Haifa or down to the city in Tel Aviv, I think things will have to change with Lebanon. And then the focus will move from Gaza to Lebanon. The troops in Gaza will move to Lebanon. Gaza will be just about containing what's there. We will not be able to, we'll have to deal with them another day, but that war will become much bigger with, with, with Hezbollah. And then that policy I spoke about, of course that would have to be applied to Lebanon if there's a Lebanon remaining. Because what Israel will have to do, and people need to understand this, Jack, what Israel will have to do in Lebanon, it will have to destroy Lebanon. There's just no other choice. And the reason is not because we want to destroy Lebanon, but every home, every building, almost everywhere, in Beirut, in Tyre, you name it, all over the country, they have stored weapons and rockets and missiles that can take out buildings and homes and factories and skyscrapers in our country. And they will try to do that. So we will have to do an operation there that our for Air Force mostly will have to do that we have never seen before. And it'll be terrible. Yeah. It'll be terrible for us, but it will also be ter mostly terrible for Lebanon. Hey, everybody. I'm Andy Stumpf, host of the Ironclad original Change Agents. For over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com.
it's been reported that we have two um, carrier battle groups headed into the or in the Mediterranean right now, specifically put there. I don't know if they said it or not, but as the deterrence to, to Iran and by proxy Hezbollah in in Lebanon. Um, do you think that's going to be enough? And then I I've been anticipating since well since this happened that another carrier battle group would move from somewhere wherever it is in the Pacific or Indian Ocean up into uh, Persian Gulf Strait of Hormuz type of type of area as a further deterrent to Iran. Um, what do you think of uh, of that deterrent strategy? And do you think it uh, do you think it'll work? So you know I can only commend the president for doing what he's done until now, which is right away dispatching the Gerald R. Ford and that carrier group, and now the Roosevelt, which I think is still on its way, but it should be here anytime soon in the Eastern Med. Standing with Israel, supporting Israel, coming to Israel, talking about, amazing. My criticism will be two. The first is, if you listen to his speeches, he says all the right things, but there's one word that he refuses to mention, and that Iran. is Iran. He doesn't say Iran. The other thing I'll just say is that these carrier groups are super important to deter Hezbollah, and we'll see if that works. But if you, no one's asking me, but my opinion, don't send them to the Eastern Med. Just what you said. You send them to the Persian Gulf, and you park them across from Iran, and you say to the Ayatollahs, if Hezbollah fires rockets at Israel, I'm not attacking Beirut. That Israel will deal with. I'm attacking Tehran. There is an opportunity. This goes back to what you and I spoke about earlier, this opportunity. There is an opportunity for the world today to change the entire dynamic here. And Iran, and, 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 and that's the opportunity that I think the president has, but it's even more than that. What we're fighting right now, the war against Hamas and the war that might come against Hezbollah, it's a proxy war. These are the proxies of the Iranians. They are funding, they are supporting, they are supplying, they are directing. If we don't do anything to the Iranians, and I'm not, I'm not advocating war against Iran, I don't want to be misunderstood, but if we don't make them pay a price or feel that they are at, are at risk, we're giving them immunity. They are the head of this octopus and we're fighting the tentacles. You have to go after the head as well. And that's the flaw that I see in the larger, wider policy right now and strategy of the US. Yeah, but I'd suspect, and obviously I have no insider information, that another carrier or carrier battle group will be headed to the Persian Gulf, or if it's not already on the way. I would just think that's just, that's the next. If you're doing that to them in the Med, it just makes sense to move one also a little closer uh, up the other other direction there. But you know, I, I don't know, but that would make make sense as a strategy. But when we're talking about that, and also President Biden flying in, and I think the same day I saw this morning that Hezbollah issued a statement about how they're thousand times or thousand fold stronger than they have been in the past on the same day that uh, President Biden was there making his his remarks. Um, at the same time, we have, I think we're giving $100 million in humanitarian aid to Gaza, to Hamas. The West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. There, there it is. Uh, at the same time, we haven't halted or frozen this six billion dollar deal with Iran. So it seems like we're almost funding two sides here. Um, it just seems odd. It seems a little off in its uh, in its messaging from the outside looking in. How do you how do you see it? L let me add to why it seems off. Right, even the six billion that was unfrozen in return, America received back. I think it was five prisoners or people who were being held by the Iran. Now, you, we could question whether it's the right deal or not, but they, there was supposed to be a uh, reciprocity. Here, Biden is announcing a hundred million dollars and getting what? They still are holding two hundred Israeli hostages. Out of them, out of that 200, I think it's up over 200 now, out of the 200, you have about 10, 11 American citizens. So why are you announcing that you're giving $100 million to the Palestinians when they're holding on to your own citizens? Where is the reciprocity? It's missing here. And I understand, listen, I do understand, Jack, Biden has the internal pressure within his party. It's complicated. We know what's going on with the Democratic Party. That's for another time. They're not all on board with what the president has done until now. So I get that he's got to play this game within American politics. But again, it sends the wrong message. And, and you know this region very well. A lot of this has to do with posturing and the message and the signals that you're sending your adversary. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That can't be, certainly can't be 
discounted why it's so befuddling to those of us looking at it uh, objectively or trying to look at it uh, that part of it uh, objectively. It just doesn't really make much sense. Um, I was wondering if you could lay out, people have heard a lot about the a war cabinet, a natural national unity government, things that we don't have in the United States. And uh, I was wondering if you could give us a brief explanation of how the Israeli government is structured, what that war cabinet means, uh, who's in it, and what that national unity government means. Uh, and for people who haven't been following along, Israel was, Israel was uh, I guess you could say, fairly divided over some judicial issues in the lead up to the attacks on October 7th. And from my perspective, as an outsider looking in, it seems like Hamas managed to, to, to unify a divided Israel. And yeah. uh, I was wondering if you, how you saw that and if you give a little uh, a little context to what a war cabinet means in Israel and what a national unity government means in Israel. So you're 100 percent right. We were divided like never before in the run up to this. And, and <laughs> I was writing numerous times how the only thing that can really bring us back together, unfortunately, is going to be a war, because when a war comes, everyone's aligned. And sadly, this is what happened. I, I, of course, <laughs> I wish there was a way to do this without this war. Um, but what's happened now, the people who said they would never sit with Netanyahu, our prime minister, because it was very right wing coalition, one of those parties led by a former chief of staff of the IDF, Benny Gantz, and his number three guy in his party is also a former chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot. They have said they're willing to join. They're not calling it a unity government. They're calling it an emergency government. So I know it's, it sounds pretty much the same thing. But what they're saying is, is that this is for the duration of the conflict and the war. What happens after the war, they'll probably pull back out, but they're there to put their hand on the steering wheel so that they can give a little more uh, uh, involvement and hopefully steer things in a more responsible way. That, that's been their explanation. I think it gives Israelis a sense of confidence because we have to remember Israel, we're not like the US. We don't have a presidential system. We're a parliamentary coalition system. So we have elections. We don't vote for an individual. We vote for a party. And then whichever party comes out with the highest number, they usually are the one that form the coalition and you form it usually with like minded parties. So in this case, we would go on through five elections in the span of about four years. And finally, Netanyahu was able to form a coalition only with the very right wing parties of the of the Knesset of our parliament. The 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 war go government now in this in this emergency government, what it does is it brings in some of the center into the government. So it, it should Hopefully what people are saying is they, they hope it will moderate the government and have people with more experience. Then what you have is you have the regular cabinet, which is all the ministers, so includes all ministers. On top of that, you have the security cabinet. That's where the officially, legally, that's the, that's the, 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 the body or the entity that has the jurisdiction to make those decisions about war and issues of national security. On top of that, they built this war cabinet, which consists of just three people and two observers the three people are the prime minister netanyahu the defense minister galant who comes from netanyahu's party he himself is a former idf general and then benny gantz this former chief of staff who joined the two observers is the other chief of staff from gantz's party gadi eisenkot and ron dermer israel's former ambassador to the u.s close ally of netanyahu who's also a minister in his government that now is the is the is the primary entity that's making these decisions and by the way blinken was here met with him for like five hours biden was here met with the war cabinet also for a few hours which by the way is interesting in of itself we've seen presidents and secretaries of state come to israel before many times they don't usually meet with the cabinet right but i think what mm. we're seeing is is really this unique u.s involvement right now and I don't want to say it's American control because I don't think that's what it is but it's really it's it's maybe it's an understanding we're in this together and we got to make also decisions somewhat together. Let me tell you about First Form. They have amazing products. My personal favorites are the protein sticks and the micro factor daily nutrient packs. And why do I like them so much? Because First Form makes it super easy to get quality protein and nutrients on the go. And I always seem to be on the go. While their products are top-notch quality, what I like the most about them are their values. First Form is so much more than a supplement company. They are deeply committed to both American jobs and your personal well-being. At First Form, they value people. In fact, the only thing they've automated 
is a tape machine, a symbol of their dedication to providing jobs and making lives better. They care about employing people, nurturing their growth, and genuinely improving lives. Their mission is simple. First Form is there to help you reach your fitness and wellness goals. They believe in a partnership where, if you meet them halfway, they'll help you make progress. Go to firstform.com slash jackcar to receive free shipping on any orders over $75. That's O-N-E-S-T-P-H-O-R-M slash jackcar. Once again, that's O-N-E-S-T-P-H-O-R-M slash jackcar and receive free shipping on any orders over $75. That, that That's all fascinating. And I know I only have you for a few more minutes here. And I want to be respectful of your time, but I hope we can do this again, because I only got through like a half of a page of the things I wanted to, to discuss with you. Um, the uh, From the outside looking in also, it seems uh, like Israel had not a not an aura of invincibility, but a mystique when it came, I think mystique might be a better term for it, uh, when it's surrounding military and intelligence services. Uh, you talk about a lot in uh, Shadow Strike, there are other operations that people have maybe read about in the news uh, in in the region. Uh, did that aura, did that get shattered over the last couple, on October 7th, I should say? Uh, was there a sense in Israel, as there was from the outside looking in, that, wow, okay, you have these three intelligence services uh, in, uh, in Israel. Um, I guess you could equate them to the CIA, FBI, and a military intelligence more Broadly speaking, if you're listening and watching in the United States, uh, you have those guys and then you have this uh, this military with this incredible history and uh, these amazing leaders and standing up against uh, armies that were greater numbers and technologically more advanced. And then all, we have October 7th. Um, yeah. What's the feeling, your feeling and then the feeling in Israel about uh, the military and uh, the intelligence services? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm curious also just you from your own personal experience, right? I don't know if you've ever trained with Israelis, right? You know, if, with our Navy SEALs, but 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 I'm sure no, that it's my, my biggest regret of my time in the military is that I didn't get to do that because we do send liaisons over. And yeah, all the send time. And, and I didn't get to do that. I was focused on Iraq and Afghanistan. So looking back, I just wish that I'd been able to do that. But but I think that what you're saying is is also the perception that you had, right? That Israel was exalted or these vaunted, you know, kind of capabilities and agencies and 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 that's how we looked at it as israelis to a large extent i think that's how the world looked at it and comes october 7th and three pillars of 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 defense just collapse all at once the first was no intelligence right i i i i wrote a piece for the free press about this of how if you look at the three strategic failures the first was the intelligence. You had 2,000, 2,500 Hamas fighters, terrorists who cross into Israel. Now, you know about how operations are planned. You got to talk to people. You got to plan things. You got to send stuff, right? Imagine the compartmentalization for this to be able to happen without Israel being able to learn of it, because we have amazing sig signal intelligence capabilities. We're listening to everything. We're watching every email and WhatsApp and, and, and phone call. We're, we're tracking it all, and we got nothing. So that means they weren't using a lot of electronic devices. They were also probably, they only had a few people at the top who really knew the full picture. The people on the bottom, they didn't know a lot. So you, it was very hard for anyone who might've learned something to put the puzzle together. And the bottom guy, if he was gonna leak something, he didn't know what the, what the others were doing. So no one really had the full story. But then once your intelligence collapsed, and it did, why did the defenses not work? We've invested billions of dollars in the most sophisticated barrier along that border, right? Physical defenses, radars, sensors, remote control guns. You have teams of, 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 of these mostly female soldiers that sit in front of a screen. They don't move. They're not allowed to look away from the screen. If they see a cockroach walk by, that sets off an alarm. And here, 2,500 people come and they don't, they don't notice anything. So Hamas was super sophisticated they were able to they dropped with 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 quadcopter drones they dropped bombs on some of these cameras they 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 had slowly normalized over months approaching the border and and making provocations and we thought maybe this is just another one they came very quickly they blew holes in they went in and then right away 
what they did also with the heavy rocket fire that was happening simultaneously. A massive barrage gave them cover and sent troops who were in those borderline outposts straight into protective rooms. So no one was, people weren't really watching and looking. It was very smart. And then there was the third failure. And this was, where was the IDF? Why did the deployment of those forces take so long to get, to regain control of those communities where people were just massacred? I mean, I was talking with one person today from one of the kibbutzes, kibbutz Beiri, 10% of, of, of that whole population wiped out, wiped out. And we, why did it take the IDF so long to get down there? So when we look at the, the, the entire picture, it's like a black hole. It really is. It, 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 it is a blow to our image, to our deterrence as a military. It's a blow to our trust as people. You know, I spoke in the beginning of my daughter, my family in the IDF. It's the blow to our trust in those commanders up there. Some of them have already taken responsibility. No one has yet to step down. I assume that after the war, there will be a, a reckoning here. But, um, but also to our deterrence, which is why when people say, why do you have to go into Gaza? What I explain to them is there are, there are two main reasons why. Right. One is we got to, first of all, put, put, push the line of contact back into Gaza, number one. Number, and we have to destroy Hamas. Right, they, they can never be allowed to do this again. That's obvious. But the second reason is because everybody's watching. Our friends are watching in America and they're saying, what happened to this close ally of ours? And our enemies, more importantly, are watching. And they're saying, if they're so weak, maybe we can do this too. So we have to project force and defense against and strength against them today. Yeah. And and you mentioned uh, the uh, Israeli soldiers monitoring those screens. And there was a there was a report that I saw about an IDF base. Was, I think it's operate uh, observation unit, mostly females who were unarmed yeah. um, near the border, uh, who were essentially massacred there. And 20, I think 23, 24 of them murdered. Just shot that. And I saw a report that some of their fathers who were IDF reservists rushed because they knew that their daughter and, and they would probably know the security situation there, that they weren't uh, as armed as they possibly could have been, uh, ran, went right there and found their daughter's dead bodies. I want I, I want to say something, Jack. When, 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 the, when the stories of October 7th are really written, and some of them are coming out, you will see stories of courage and bravery the likes of which will, 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 will move people to tears. Like you mentioned fathers. I have a friend who's a journalist who lives down south in one of those kibbutzes who was under attack, locked his, him, him and his wife and their kids in the safe room. There were five terrorists outside with RPGs, AK-47s, grenades, trying to shoot their way in. He called his father, who's a former general, who got into a car, drove down it took hours to break through because they were fighting all along the way and grab connected with it with a special forces unit and they fought their way in and he was able to kill terrorists save other people and save his own son daughter-in-law and grandchildren you have so many stories like that of people who just who 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 who, who were sitting at home heard what happened grabbed a gun and drove down and just did what they had to do and people i know of two brothers i heard of who did this? Both were killed. I mean, people. The, the the stories of the bravery of these of these Jewish fighters will will it will, will be like a new a new Old Testament almost. Uh, and, you know, to to compare to those stories that we saw millennia ago. Wow. And before I let you go, I know you have to you have to go. Um, uh, I did want so also growing up, I've just been. A, I knew I was going to the military, so I'm always studying military history, intelligence, or anything I could get as a kid. I'm reading magazines and books, anything I could possibly find. And there are these images of of Israel that I had from from that time, and then that the continued on, obviously, and stayed stayed with me. And I've seen other since, uh, like the lone woman standing out with like a Mauser rifle in like the early '50s or something like that, uh, defending the kibbutz, like guarding the kibbutz. Um, what happened to that over? time when it came to uh, a citizen soldier like that being armed right there ready to to fight it seems like over time i don't know if it's a proliferation of more stringent 
gun laws or whatever else it may have been making it more difficult to have something right there readily available as a citizen especially if you're in that gaza envelope it just seems to make sense that you would want to defend your life your family's lives your kibbutz and have that option um, if that's not an option for a lot of these communities now do you think it will be become an option in the future will things change first of all things are definitely going to change right they're they're, they're going to have to redo the whole security and the security rapid response teams there are there, there are rapid response teams in all these communities but they didn't have enough weaponry, not enough ammo, and not enough people, and not the right communication devices and protective and tactical gear. And the reason was, I think, and you're right also about there, there have been more stricter uh, uh, regulations on getting a gun license, right? They don't just give it to anyone like we thought maybe in Israel, right? The, 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 a, a lot of these changes will happen because what ultimately failed for Israel was the policy and the, and the strategic or this myth that we thought of containment that we can live here, we'll put up a big wall, we'll deploy some soldiers along the border, we'll listen to their phones, and we'll know what's going on. But that collapsed. So now what needs to happen is we have we now recognize what we're dealing with. That's the big wake up call. And, and the changes that will come will be broad, extensive, and across everything in Israel. And I think it's going to change what we saw the, the attacks on October 7th are going to change society. They're going to change the electorate. They're going to change our position in this region. And they're going to change the way we secure, secure our communities. Although I was speaking with a friend of mine who lives in one of the kibbutzes there. It's a woman. It's got four kids. They were locked in their safe room the whole day. Thankfully, they were able to get out. And I was talking to her after I said, do you, do you and your husband have a weapon? And she said, Yaakov, until today, no, but trust me, we're going to have a bunch after this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to let you let you go. I have so many more questions for you, pages of questions. I hope we can do this again. Uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to, to read your, your articles. There was the, uh, the recent one on the ambush, uh, how Israel got ambushed. Um, they should check that one out for sure. And pick up the book Shadow Strike also, because though it's not specifically, like I said in the beginning, about what's going on right now, it provides additional context that I think is extremely valuable if you're trying to understand that part of the world. And uh, quickly, could you, in Shadow Strike, what do you think the world would or the region would look like today had this mission not succeeded? I mean, Israel destroyed a nuclear reactor in 2007 in northeastern Syria that North Korea was building for it, right? And the book basically tells the story of how we detected, we learned of it with an amazing intelligence operation, how we worked closely with the Americans to, 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 to gather more intel and to plan out the mission. But I think the big story there, and this is the big lesson that I walked away with, is there, there's a phone call that President then George W. Bush places to our then Prime Minister Ulmer and says, listen, I'm not attacking. I want to, I want to do diplomacy. And Ulmer says to the president, unacceptable. If you're not going to do it, I have the responsibility for the Jewish people. We have to, we, we can't allow this to happen. And we can imagine, Jack, Syria with nuclear weapons. Had, had had they had the nuclear weapons when the, when the people rose up against them, what would have happened if they still had fallen and ISIS had taken over? They took over Deir Azur, right, back in 2014. Imagine if Israel had never destroyed, what would happen? ISIS would have nuclear weapons, right? Israel saved not just itself, it saved the world. But what it teaches us is an important lesson about this country, is that at the end of the day, Israel understands its role, and that is to protect and preserve the Jewish people. That's what you see in that book. That's what you're seeing now in these days in the aftermath of October 7th. And I just want to say and finish up also, Jack, with just thanking you for really taking an interest in this. I've seen how over the last since this happened, you've taken a big interest in just the work that you've done over the years. I'm a big fan, particularly the Terminal List and some of your other books as well. But um, but really, thank you for, for what you do in your service and your interest and, and, and the importance that you see in the relationship between our countries, because that that alliance is so key to our survival. And I, I would say even to just the survival of a free world. I sincerely appreciate that. And uh, thoughts and prayers are with, with you and uh, your daughter and nephews and everyone else in Israel who's about to go into even further into harm's way as this thing moves forward here so um so best wishes and i hope we can do this again because uh it's been it fantastic be talking to you and uh and and please reach out if you ever need anything thank you jack thanks for everything take care
I've been a fan of Black Rifle Coffee Company since their inception. I love when veterans leave the military and pursue their passion. In this case, coffee. The coffee is fantastic, and as an added benefit, the company is built on quality, patriotism, and giving back to the veteran and first responder communities. I've been a subscriber to the BRCC Coffee Club for years and love it. My favorite is Silencer Smooth. It gets delivered every single month. The Black Rifle Coffee Club. Being part of the club gives you the power to elevate your coffee experience to the next level. The Black Rifle Coffee Club puts you in the driver's seat. You pick the texture and the roast you want, the frequency you want it delivered, and the quantity. You get to completely personalize your club orders, ensuring that your favorite coffee is sent to your door exactly how you want it, when you want it. Right now, Black Rifle Coffee is offering an exclusive opportunity for new Coffee Club members. Join today and enjoy 30% off your first order when you use the discount code DANGERCLOSE at checkout. That's right, 30% off just for being a part of our growing coffee community. Remember to use the discount code DANGERCLOSE at checkout. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close Podcast. An Ironclad Original, presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Yakov Katz, be sure and visit his website, Yakov Katz, and that is Y-A-A-K-O-V-K-A-T-Z dot com. Be sure and pick up Shadow Strike. He has two other books out there as well, The Weapon Wizards and Israel versus Iran. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you got something out of this podcast, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting.